In the Mood for Love is generally regarded as Wong Kar Wai's best film, and in the eyes of its fans and many critics, it's also hailed as one of the best films ever made. Telling the story of two neighbours who grow close after learning about their spouse's infidelity, In the Mood for Love perfectly captures all the ideas and themes of longing, time and missed opportunities that Wong had been working on since his debut film, As Tears Go By. Yet despite its respected status today, the film was marred by issues behind the scenes. I didn't know what I was doing for the first nine months. Our location manager is extremely mad. Do you know what the story is about? I said, no, how will I know? But before we tell that story, I think it's important to first understand what kind of image the world had of Wong as a director prior to making In the Mood for Love. And to do that, we're going to have to start this video in 1996. After spending what felt like forever editing Ashes of Time and quickly making Fallen Angels, Wong went into production on Happy Together and set his queer drama in Buenos Aires, Argentina. But by this point in his career, Wong was already known for not writing traditional scripts. I'm a script writer before I make my own films, and I, I hate writing. To have a script and then shoot it is very boring, because you have to imagine all the details in your mind and write it down is, uh, is a process which I hate. He preferred to provide those on set with only an outline of the film, and with little information given to his cast and crew as to what they were filming, no one really knew how Happy Together was going to look or what kind of story was even being told. Not even Wong, who for the most part was just making it up as he went along. Unsurprisingly, the production was a mess. Wong's longtime cinematographer Christopher Doyle kept a diary during the film's production, and in his entries, it appeared that almost everyone was growing tired of Wong's creative process. During the shoot, Wong felt he needed more characters to tell his story, and called in singer Shirley Kwan and actor Chang Chen to fill the roles that he had in his head. Chang's scenes made into the final film, but Kwan's scenes were cut entirely, and would only resurface in the documentary Buenos Aires Zero Degree. Leslie Chung, who was one of the biggest stars in Asia at the time, was coming in and out of Argentina, forcing production to work around his busy schedule. And after some budget issues, the local Argentinian crew was dropped early in production, causing them to call on their union to delay production and make filming that much harder. Plagued by these issues, it's a miracle that Wong not only finished the film, but garnered major awards and critical praise for Happy Together all around the world. Wong's loose filmmaking methods proved hellish in Argentina, but it wouldn't be the last time he'd experience chaos in a film. While Wong was in France promoting Happy Together, he met with Maggie Chung over dinner. Chung expressed to Wong that she wanted to work with the director again, and followed that up by saying that she specifically wanted to work with Tony Leung, especially considering that both broke out as emerging stars on the television drama series Police Cadet 84. Wong took Chung's suggestion and devised a new project, Summer in Beijing, a film that would star Tony and Maggie as two Hong Kong expats in Beijing who'd always try and meet at Tiananmen Square. Takeshi Kaneshiro was also lined up. Wong shot some test footage and even made posters for the film, but Chinese censors weren't pleased with his idea. According to Wong, they disapproved of the picture's title, and not having a script to vet was also a problem. Unfazed by this, Wong kept his intended title, changed the concept, and found a new location to shoot. Instead of telling one story, he wanted to tell three separate stories set in different time periods in the one film. Connecting all three stories would be a Macau-based restaurant called Beijing, as well as his two lead actors, this time playing three different characters across all three short stories. Now things get a little bit muddy here, but somewhere along the way, Wang it seems decided to change the title from Summer in Beijing to either Three Stories About Food or A Story About Food. There's a lot of contradictory accounts here that Wang has given in interviews. Now this part is purely conjecture, but I suspect the tentative titles and perhaps even aspects of his original concept were changed because Wong couldn't film in Macau, as Maggie Chung explains. He wanted to shoot in Macau, and at that time Macau was having some political problems, 
and we couldn't go there. Over time, he became more creatively invested in just one of the three stories, and soon decided to turn what was a 30-minute short into what we now know as In the Mood for Love. But what happened to the other two stories in Wong's original vision? What we do know is that one of the missing stories was edited and screened in private as a short film during a Cannes Film Festival masterclass. Wong called it In the Mood for Love 2001 and set his short at a 7-Eleven store in the present day. Though it hasn't screened anywhere else to this day, parts of the short would later be used as inspiration for Wong's only English language feature today, My Blueberry Nights. As for the other story, all we really know about it is that it involved a kidnapping. Maybe that short was meant to be the Days of Being Wild sequel that we never got. Or maybe it was set sometime in 1984. The further production went on, the more problems arose. Wong generally preferred real locations over sets, and decided to move production to Thailand, where parts of Bangkok looked and felt closer to his memories of 1960s Hong Kong. Our location manager is extremely mad because he said, well, oh, we have a grand building, we have a very nice feast, we have a, a wonderful places. Why you go all the way to this small alleys and the shabby place? And he said, because I know the smell of it. So, whenever I look at the streets, I understand what kind of people, what kind of person live in this space, what would they do, what is their living. Interiors were all done in Hong Kong, but the film's exterior shots, such as those out on the streets, in the taxi, and in the Singapore scenes, these were all done in Thailand. Here's Chris Doyle talking a little bit about why Bangkok made sense. When we're shooting the film, I just thought we should shoot through things because it gives it more dimension. It gives it, it feels more like somewhere people live. And, and so, I think one of the best shots in Mutual Love is basically just tracking like this through this space. Speaking of Doyle, Wong's DP left production partway through the film to work in America and direct his own film, Away With Words. Ho Xiao Shen's longtime cinematographer, Mark Lee Ping Bin, was called in to replace Doyle. It wasn't Lee's first time working with Wong, but the experience was still difficult. So this particular director, he just raises questions, he asks you a question, and you need to figure out the specifics. You need to figure out the answer yourself. He allows you ways to show your own distinctive style. However, his criticism, that's all he does, are quite harsh, because he would just come out flat out and say, it's horrible. In the past, Wong trusted Doyle and didn't need to give him a lot of direction. But with Lee, Wong had to become more hands-on. On this project, it is not a film that looks like my previous film. So I have to control all the things, and I'm more involved in the framing, lighting, everything. And it is a process of creative, a creative process, which I can get uh, more control on it, and I think now the look of the film is more attached to the content. The Asian financial crisis also brought production to a halt, forcing Wong to turn to investors overseas that could continue bankrolling the film. And in the periods where production came to a halt, Wong decided to make the most of his Thailand setting by shooting another film entirely, 2046. But based on various accounts, it was Maggie Chung who perhaps had the hardest time working with Wong. We spent six months of this shooting things to make the script. The script. So that's why in, in total the film was shot in 15 months instead of three. But I didn't realize that was what was happening to me until today that I'm talking about it, that actually that's why it took so long and I was so frustrated and I didn't know what, what I was doing for the first nine months because we were scripting the film together. Despite a brief cameo in Ashes of Time, her last experience working closely and intensely with Wong was during the shoot for Days of Being Wild, which for her was a fun experience. She struggled to understand what kind of person her character was and grew frustrated with Wong's tedious approach the longer production went on. I always knew that he worked without a script, so everything is built from zero. And from one scene, it would inspire him to the next and the next and the next. And at first, I really found that, why do you have to make films like that? Why, why can't you get it all prepared and then we start shooting instead of having 30, 40 people on set every day waiting 
for you to be inspired. But then after a while, I realized there's nothing I can do about it. That's his style. And to love him as a director or as a friend, you just have to accept that that's the way he is. Much like his other films, Wong improvised with his cast to find the characters and story. In an interview with the New York Times, Maggie revealed that she'd received a still warm fax during hair and makeup, with lines that were clearly written that morning, and that while filming, Wong would try different variations of scenes by switching dialogue between the two main characters, or shooting the scene in a completely different location. Chung's frustrations were further exacerbated by the fact that she had to travel between continents to complete this film. At the time, she was living in France with her former husband Olivier Essayas, the French filmmaker who directed her in the films Irma Vep and Clean. According to Maggie, production wrapped on In the Mood for Love four times, which would mean she had to go back and forth between France and either Hong Kong or Thailand four times over to film scenes that Wong didn't even plan for. Fortunately for the actress, she began to adapt to Wong's methods thanks to her co-star. She used to have a lot of questions and I always tell her, why don't you ask the director and don't ask me? <laughs> she used to help me, do you know what the story is about? I said, no, how will I know? And so I tell her, don't think too much about what the story will be and try to, you know, just get into the character and live in the character and try to feel our surroundings and, and try to feel everything. And finally, I, I, I recognize that she's getting into the character. She's a very good actress too, and I don't think I can be that good without her. So to recap, Wong had to find financial help after the Asian financial crisis, deal with the disappearance of his cinematographer, make up In the Mood for Love as he was going along, and film two movies all at once. It's a wonder how this film even got made. Eventually, Wong got all the footage he needed, but even he was still unsure as to what shape the film would take or how the characters would even be portrayed. Wong could have taken In the Mood for Love in so many different directions based on the vast amount of footage that he got. An alternative ending saw Maggie and Tony's characters reunite in Cambodia, which were scrapped. Scenes that took place in the 1970s were filmed, but never used. And even this little dancing number, which has made the rounds on the internet a few times, would have made for a happier deviation of the story that we ended up getting. The original intent behind some scenes were also changed, like this famous shot, which was supposed to lead into an intimate scene between Tony and Maggie's characters. In Wong's own words, he could have made this film forever if he wanted to. That's one of the reasons we want to present a film here in Cannes, because we can make this film forever. We have to find a way to stop this production. We need a deadline. So, okay, I said, okay, we can go to Cannes, and then now we know we have to stop all the things, and it's time to say goodbye to the project. With Khan hovering over his shoulder, Wong and his editor William Chang toiled to put the pieces together. Wong even asked for a slight extension and requested that Khan organizers make In the Mood for Love the final film to screen at the festival. According to Wong, subtitles for the film were still being put together the morning before its Khan screening, and when it came time to present the film to Khan, it wasn't even 100% complete, as the sound was presented in mono rather than the industry standard of Dolby Stereo. Finally, after 15 months, Wong and his team made it to the finish line. The reviews were in and just about everyone loved the film. Wong and his team would continue to promote the film worldwide following its reception at Cannes, as In the Mood for Love travelled from country to country, earning praise every step of the way. Wong knew he still had to complete 2046, but it would take him another four years to complete the film. In the Mood for Love today stands tall as a modern classic, yet I can't help but imagine how things might have turned out if Wong wrote an actual script or if all these other factors hadn't slowed things down to the point where it was completed in 15 months. That's a long time to spend on most things, but maybe that length was actually a blessing in disguise. If the first three months that we were shooting and that was it and it finished, I, I, this character or 
the way I presented this character would be something else. And I know I would be very upset if that was the case. So in, in many ways, I'm very grateful for the length of the film because not many films or actors would have a chance to have a year or over a year for you to really understand the character or to just to get used to who you are when you're on the set. And, and for this film, I think the length of it was very important. This isn't to let Wong off the hook completely though, and as much as I love his films, it's easy to understand why those who've worked with him have had their own issues with Wong's creative methods. Yet for all of Wong's criticisms as a director, there's no denying that there's a method in all the madness, and that In the Mood for Love's troubled production only further made clear to everyone what to expect, or rather what not to expect, when you step into a Wong Kar Wai film. I wanna do those cool things. How come I don't get to do those cool things? <laughs> like, going out shooting with big movie stars without a script. Like, um, shooting for weeks, months, years, and then throw it away and start over again. If the actors are leaving the set and doesn't come back, and I don't know how finish the film and just hire another actor and another ending just to wrap it up and, and winning all the awards. Uh, I wish I could do that. I wish I could wear those sunglasses at night. 